and it's great to be with you on um, this cold Canberra uh, morning. I was in New York um, about two days ago and it was the equivalent of 35 degrees and it was very warm and I was in a subway sweltering and here I am shivering <laughs> still. But um, it's a delight to be back here. This is probably only the second time I make it to um, Australia this year. I was here back in March and um, it's a delight to particularly come here for this conference. I know my friend um, Akram Azimi, one of my best friends in fact, um, he was obviously Young Australian of the Year last year and he spoke to something like I think 350,000 Australians or something insane over the course of his time as the Young Australian of the Year. But one of the ones which he spoke a lot about was actually this conference. And I know, you know, Father Richard, he particularly admired your leadership in bringing this together. And he just felt there was something real special about the community you guys are nurturing here. So when Richard um, invited me, I was hoping to catch up when I was here in March. And he said, well, why don't you come back in early August? I thought, well, that sounds like a great idea. So it's great to be with you all and with you today. Now, in terms of what I do, it's funny, people often say, I had it yesterday actually over lunch when I was in Sydney. Someone said, but what is it you actually do? And I've tried to come up with all sorts of um, answers and responses to that and realized I just couldn't get it in, in 30 seconds. I remember being on a plane once, um, sat next to this girl and she goes, what is it you do? And I, I just thought I would try this and I said, I work for an international advocacy organization grown in Australia but based in New York that's working to build the political and public world to end extreme poverty by 2030. And she kind of looked at me and blinked. She goes, are you like James Bond or something? And I said, no, I wish. Um, so instead what I do is I actually concentrate on the why. And it was something that Akram actually taught me last year. He said, Michael, people aren't interested in who or what, it's not what makes people interested, it's actually why they do something. That's what gives you a good sense of someone's character. And what I've come to learn, particularly uh, I'm, I'm an advocate, you know, I speak on behalf of those who can't in, in situations where they're not able to or where they're oppressed. And what I've come to learn is that actually, if you can't articulate why you're interested or passionate in an idea such as climate change, or maybe it's um, you know, migration law, or maybe it's just an idea, you know, or maybe it is you want to get lots of money and that's something you want to do. If you can't articulate why, you know, then it's really hard, I think, for people to ultimately trust you and get behind you and, and to relate to you as well. So with that in mind, I want to start by sharing my why. And it was something which I kind of had in the back of my mind. And sometimes you only really realize the why when you really sit down, let thoughts come together and think about it. And I realized my why, actually in January last year, I had finished law school at the end of 2012 in, in Perth, um, on the other side of the country. And me and one of my friends, who was an engineer, we decided that we was gonna spend a month in Egypt. And it was actually the second time I'd ever been to Egypt. I'd spent a day there um, back in the late 90s with my, with my parents here. And when, I, when we were visiting the, the Great Pyramids of Giza, afterwards we went on the felucca down the Nile. And I remember it was empty because it was just after the revolution. And we decided that we'd sleep and camp on the backs of the Nile. And we were looking down you know, on this barge and we were looking up at the sky. And we saw all the stars there, and it was, it was brilliant, you know. You could see them in all their glory. And I thought, you know, thinking back to the pharaohs thousands of years ago who were looking up at the same sky. And I said to, to my friend, I said, you know, it's about 12 years or so, or actually 14 years ago since I was last here. You know, have you ever thought about in that same time frame how much you changed? And he said, well, you know, I know something that's probably changed for you. And I said, well, what's that? And he goes, he actually taps my belly, and he goes, well, Mike, I'm sorry to say, one thing is you're probably not, not as skinny as you used to be. And I thought, well, thanks. And then I thought, it got me thinking, OK, well, that's physically how much I've changed, which is not necessarily a positive thing. And I thought, well, what about other ways I've changed? And it occurred to me that this kid here, this 12-year-old boy, when I started high school at the end of 2000, it was actually very different to the, to the guy I am today. You know, I remember starting high school and I was the new kid on the block. 
And has anyone ever been the new, the new kid in school where you kind of go in and they introduce you and they say, this is, this is Michael, he's going to be a new student here. Yet some nodding of the heads. Well, I had that experience. And I remember walking in and being petrified. I remember this feeling of isolation. I remember sitting in the corner, afraid to reach out and speak to the people next to me. And the reason why is when I was in primary school, I actually had a, a speech impediment. So, you know, I couldn't say certain words, you know, three became free, you know, the was often the, you know, it was these things which, um, you know, in all honesty, it's not such a big deal. But when you're young and you're at school, you know, kids can sometimes be cruel and I'd get teased, I would get bullied, people would try and mimic the way I spoke. And then what happened is soon enough all these, um, all this kind of, you know, attacks on my confidence and self-esteem, it really seeped into other ways. You know, I would be playing sport and I'd be kicking a ball and I'd be so petrified that people were watching me and I was going to stuff up in front of them. That would actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Somehow, believe it or not, I'd aim to kick the ball at the, at the goalposts and it would end up going in the opposite direction. I'd aim to throw, you know, a cricket ball and for some reason, you know, I'd throw it in the wrong way all the way upfield. And it also affected my studies as well. I remember starting high school and my mum actually signed me into special um, learning classes, you know, particularly for English and maths and these kind of things. And I remember my year eight teacher, you know, showed my mum where I ranked in the, in the league, league tables and I was ranked near the bottom of the class. And then something happened, you know, sometime through that year, you know, and I had no aspirational bone in my body. You know, I didn't care that I wasn't doing that well, it didn't really matter. And one day we came in and we had to do this test. And we could do it on anything related to history. And one of the things, you know, we spoke about passions before, one of the things which um, is a great passion of mine, in fact, um, um, I, it's something I do a lot in my spare time in New York, it's actually history, and I actually have historical pub crawls I run, I run um, walking tours, and all the rest of it. But I realized, I wrote this out, and I did it on Gladiators, because this movie had just come out with Russell Crowe. I didn't think much of it. And I walked home, and when I got home, my mum, she kind of had this weird look on her face, and she said, oh, you've got this message on the answer machine, and it's from your year eight teacher, Mr. Byrne. So I listened to it, and he said, hi, Mrs. Sheldrick. He goes, I've noticed, a, I've noticed a sudden change in Michael. Can you give me a call back? And I thought, that's a slightly strange and creepy message. <laughs> it doesn't sound good. And my mum, I realized the reason why she had this confused look on her face is because after years of a decade or more being told that I was a failure, and I was failing, or Michael had done this poorly, had done this badly, my teacher had run to say that somehow I had topped the class in this test. And I went in the next day and Mr. Byrne said, I think there's more to you than, than meets the eye here. And he goes, and he showed me the lead and he said, as a result of this, you're now ranked third in the class. And I don't know what it was that thought. For the first time ever, um, you know, I just thought I'd try. And I said, Mr. Byrne, do you think I could be number one by the end of the year? He said, yeah, yeah, I think you could. You know, I'll be here to support you. Come in if you're doing an assignment, run it past me. And anyway, six months go past. And on the last day of school, for one reason or another, I wasn't there. But I remember being sat at home on the lounge suite. And I remember looking out the window and down by the garage, there walked Mr. Byrne. And um, I opened the door and I was like, Mr. Byrne, what are you doing coming to my house? What are you doing here today? And he just outstretched his hand and he said, well done, mate. And he gave me this certificate with a number one on, which my mum still has to this day. And for me, that was very much a turning point. You know, I ended up finishing year 12, you know, topping all my subjects, got into law school at EWA. Um, you know, all, all these amazing things. I'd get accepted into Cambridge, um, which I didn't accept for other reasons. But when I look back on it, you know, it's funny. People went from calling me stupid to when I finished year 12 saying, oh, you're so smart. And the thing is, though, is I never, never lost sight of what it was to be that deeply, that kid who felt deeply isolated, who felt stupid. I never lost sight of what that was. And I thought to myself, yes, I'd certainly worked hard. But you know what? Yes, it, it, there was something within me. Um, deep down, that was probably always there. But it took a teacher to help bring that out. 
It was the fact I had great health care, great education, it was living in this great country of Australia that gave me that. And I realised that there's probably millions of children, in fact more than a billion around the world, who probably have that same yearn, desire deep within them, but through no fault of their own, because they're born into extreme poverty, they won't be able to fulfil that. And that's where, what I, you know, to be honest, that's where I found my calling. And that's where I got behind it, and I thought, whatever I do, it's going to be promoted now. And I didn't know how to do it, I just knew that that was the idea, and I, from there I got involved when I was at uni, and eventually, you know, cutting a long story short, I would get involved in the movement to end, end polio. And polio was this disease which had almost been eradicated, but the reason why I got excited about it is because I thought, well, it had been 99% eradicated. I thought for all the cynics out there who said the world without extreme poverty was impossible, if we could finish this disease once and for all, this disease that once paralysed up to 40,000 children a day, and even in Australia back in the 40s and 50s, I thought we would come up with a powerful symbol, a symbol that said, you know what, there's no better way than to show that the world without extreme poverty is possible than to say we've just helped uh, eradicate a disease. So I got involved, it was this 20 million volunteer effort around the world, they call it the world's largest non-violent army. You know, I got to go to India, I got to um, see how polio in the year I was born in 1988, you know, it infected 125 countries around the world, and in my lifetime alone, it was, um, I've done something here, I've turned it off, there you go, um, but I got to, <laughs> so ne never without any troubles. But, um, you know, I learned that in my lifetime alone, it had been reduced to just these four countries here, um, Nigeria, Pakistan, India, and, and Afghanistan. And I, and, I, and I thought to myself, you know, as we, as we got involved, I thought, well, we, can, we can finish this once and for all. And, and I realised that there was amazing people doing great work on the ground, and my expertise wasn't as an epidemiologist, it wasn't in terms of conflict revolution, with um, people for various reasons killing health workers. Well, I realised it was as an activist, and it was calling the global community to actually continue to fund these efforts. And, you know, what started as an idea, that's all it was, it was an idea. I had nothing else behind us. You know, we managed to meet with Julia, Julia Gillard, we packaged this idea up, we, we told her the why, we got Kevin Rudd on board, we, we asked the government to contribute. The Australian government up until that point had only given $17 million. Akram and I went back to Pakistan last year, we even met with Tony Abbott, we got in his ear, um, we, <laughs> met with, we met with Bill Gates, and you know what, you know, there's so many amazing things that happened. But what, I'll just show you one of those brief stories. Last year, Akram and I, we had been campaigning for the government before it left office. We said, can you, can you contribute an additional $80 million to this effort? And I remember it was actually the first time we came to Radford College that same week. We went down and we saw Julie Gillard after question time. And this was probably about a month before she left office. And I remember um, as we walked in there, we said, look, can you give us this money? Can you give us this additional $80 million? And she said, look, I can't make any commitments to you today, but um, let, 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 let me tell you now that I am extending good faith to this. I think something might be possible, but you know what? I need you guys to show me the public world. So we got people to send in letters from all over Australia. We got hundreds sending in, and I'll never forget, we were actually in Kenya um, Akram and I, we were staying because we couldn't afford to stay in the hotel, or rather we were too stingy to pay for it. We were <laughs> staying for free in the outhouse of all the drivers there. And we kind of have these mosquito nets over us so we don't get malaria. And I remember getting this call at 6 a.m. in the morning, and I thought, he's trying to call me, I'm, I'm not going to answer that. Um, but of course, there was a message, and I was up, and I was interested, so I listened to it. And I had it on loudspeaker, and it was a friend in Melbourne saying, you never guess what's happened. The Prime Minister's office is trying to get in touch with you. She just put out this press release announcing the $80 million. And Akram heard that, and I'll never forget, he kind of jumped out of bed, didn't realise the mosquito net was there, <laughs> rolled down into it, gave me a massive bear hug, and then we ran up to the hotel at 6 a.m. in the morning banging so we could get in and get the Wi-Fi so, <laughs> so we could download this press release and read it. And, um, you know, I, it's funny, I, I now work with Julia Gillard. Um, she's now working in global education. And when I saw her earlier this year, I actually shared that story with her to show what, what had happened. Um, it was one of the last decisions she had made. And, 
very pleased to say that you know there's been a lot of stuff since the election in terms of the aid and development, which I won't go into, but one of the things which we did get Tony Abbott to agree to, and actually it's the only big announcement on this he's made this year, was to actually reaffirm the government's commitment to that, and indeed he actually went above and beyond and contributed $100 million, so we were very happy with that. And it was, you know, for us, it, it marked a turning point. But you know what? Whilst we've had amazing results, so those four countries earlier this year, we saw India, you know, a country which the cynics once said is, it's not possible to eradicate polio in India. They said it has large numbers of people living in extreme poverty, large population density. You've got poor sanitation infrastructure. In short, it's the perfect storm for the threat of, threat of polio to spread. And they said this is where the virus was born. And yet earlier this year, you know, proved the cynics wrong. And India has now gone several years without polio and was declared polio free. But despite this amazing news, you know, the broader picture st for us still remains the end of extreme poverty. And what is the end of extreme poverty? Well, people say, you know, if that sounds very airy-fairy. Well, wrong. It's not an airy-fairy dream. It is something that can be done. In my lifetime alone, when I was born, over 50% of the world's population was living in extreme poverty. And yet in the last 25 years, we've seen that reduced to 51%. Last year, I, I made the decision to move to New York in May. Um, I've been living there over a year. And just after I moved there, this, these two men pictured here, one is the Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon. The other is um, um, the President of the World Bank, Jim Kim. Both are South Korean. And both actually told this story. They said that they grew up in Korea, and when they were born in Korea, you know, they had just had the war, and at this time, South Korea was poorer than North Korea. Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, would tell you about how he remembers reading books delivered from the UN, and now he's heading up the UN. And Jim Kim, you know, he remembers his grandparents living in poverty, and he got this scholarship to go to America and study there. And he went to Harvard, he became a doctor, he became a leading figure in the movement to end HIV AIDS. And then something happened a couple of years ago. Um, President Obama was faced with this decision. You know, many people think the most important appointments a president will make is to the Supreme Court or to, um, you know, to the Secretary of State or a cabinet position. But I think there was a far more momentous one in terms of the world's poor. You see, he was faced with who to appoint as the next president of the World Bank. And the World Bank, it's the largest aid development organization in the world. It gives out about $50 billion a year, which is more than any other aid agency there is. To put it in perspective, Australia gives out around $5 billion a year. And typically, the World Bank, for various reasons, has been criticized. In fact, Jim Kim actually campaigned in the 90s for the abolition of the World Bank because he thought it was part of the system keeping people into extreme poverty. And every single person who had headed up the World Bank since it was founded in 1945, you know, has been a hardline economist. But Barack Obama said, I'm actually going to do something differently. I'm not actually going to appoint an economist to head up the World Bank. And people said, you're crazy, it's a bank. You need an economist there. They said, no, I'm actually going to appoint an anthropologist mm -hmm. and a doctor named Jim Kim to head it up. The World Bank hasn't been running with economists, so why are we going to do the same thing that's been failing for the last 65 years? Why don't we try something new? And so he came up and he gave this to Jim Kim. And last year, Jim Kim said, the World Bank helped end extreme poverty in parts of Europe. It was started because after the um, Second World War, it rebuilt Europe. Let's return it to basics. And he got his economists together. He boasts a thousand economists at the World Bank, which he says has 2,000 opinions between them. And he said, let's, let's come up with a roadmap. How can we end extreme poverty? And let's put a date on it. And the date he came up <coughs> with was the year 2030. And he said, let's get member states to, shri to agree to this goal and shrine it in international law to end extreme poverty by 2030. And he said, this isn't a prediction. It's not a prediction. It's not going to happen on business as usual. In fact, business as usual may actually see more people living in extreme poverty than there are today, which is roughly a billion people. But he said, with the right interventions and with countries stepping up, we can see this change. 
And he said, so here's what I'm going to agree to. I'm going to agree to increase the number of amount of grants we give in a year from $50 billion to $75 billion a year. I'm going to put my personal credibility on the line and I'm asking others to do the same. I was at the World Bank two weeks ago and I met with this Bangladeshi who's heading up the water and sanitation practice. And this guy is saying for the first time ever, we now look at tangible solutions on how we can do this. But you know what? The key thing that he said is every country needs to step up. And this is where I want to turn back to Australia because it's amazing. You do get a perspective when you live as an expat overseas about Australia. And living in Perth, you know, which is the most isolated city in the world, and um, as much as I love it, you know, sometimes it is hard to get a global perspective there. It's easy to think that Australia is dismissed on the world stage. We don't matter. And what I've found living in New York is actually Australia does matter. On the one hand, you know, they talk about this Aussie invasion in New York. So apparently about 1% of the population of New York City is now Australian. And you, know, you can find them everywhere. In fact, one thing that Australians are known for is actually our coffee, funny enough. And it's almost this joke saying that 20 years ago, Australians used to see as these kind of unsophisticated bogans. Whereas now in New York, if you want the latest trends, people say you talk to Australians about what's going on. But also, also, be that as it may, the biggest thing is actually politically as well. As I go around the UN member states, I realize that actually Australia does matter. And in fact, one of the things we often hear is this cringe-worthy line, Australia punching above its weight on the global stage. And actually, I want to dismiss that myth because Australia punching above its weight on the world stage, to me, this in itself is coming from this outdated sense of Australia being this old outpost, colonial outpost in the far-flung corners of the world that doesn't matter. Anything we do do is a bonus. No, the real question is, is how can we act commensurate with our weight? That's what we should be asking ourselves. Because Australia is widely respected, and I don't want any politician or leader to get away with when they say, ah, oh, Australians shouldn't get ideas above their station. You know, Australia is a middle power, but no more, we can't influence things. No, actually we can, and I've seen it, and we need to step up and play that role, and I'm convinced the next 15 years is the time to do it. One thing I want to leave you guys all with is something that you can do, and something we've launched right now if you want to get involved in, because young people, there's 1.8 billion youth that's aged between 10 and 25 in the world at the moment, and in fact, over the next couple of years, we're actually see young people, that is people aged under 25, come to account for more than 50% of the world's entire population. It's essentially going to be a young planet, and the world is in our hands. And so it's something that we've launched. Next year, we're asking the global community in September to enshrine a set of goals that will put end in extreme poverty at the 2030, which say this is the world we want, issues like climate change, everything. And so what we're convinced that needs to happen is we want to get 8 million people in this part of this youth movement. We want to hand it over to the UN Secretary General and world leaders. We want to tell them, you know, these are the voices of young people. And we're actually going to start with a, um, with a, with a selfie campaign. And it's called, it's called Show Your Selfie. And um, something you can do is, um, if you're interested, you can post a photo with the hashtag show your selfie. One thing is we're going to send out these packs and maybe you can speak to Richard and we can get some emails and we can send some packs out for you guys to get involved. But it is a youth movement we're trying to build. We're trying to demonstrate that actually young people want this, want this more than any ever before. And I guess lastly, what I want to share with you is, um, um, is this video. You know, we often think about ending extreme poverty by 2030. What does it look like? We asked this village, and we produced this video basically looking into the future as to what it could be like. There was a time when humanity was divided against itself. Over a billion of us, we are living in extreme poverty. While others had more than they needed.
Millions of our children were unable to go to school. It might be hard for you to imagine a world like this, but this is our story. But Mzee, what caused the great shift? The people came together, much like we have gathered tonight, and it changed everything. We began to see ourselves as equals, as global citizens. Every single child was able to go to school. The world came alive. Humanity advanced. You see, when we come together, we can do more. Some said this world was not possible, but you are proof that it is. The new world is yours to protect. My children, we must now begin. In, in closing, just a finish of one last story. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Islamabad in Pakistan, and I was asked to address these, these medical students um, about what we were doing around polio. And as I finished this um, lecture, you know, I walked down and, you know, again, my stomach thinking before my head or anything else, I saw this buffet, and it looked amazing. And uh, I just made for a beeline. And as I was approaching it, everyone wanted to speak to me. You know, I was a bit of a novelty because they hadn't met Australian before, so I was speaking to them, and I just remember wanting to get to this food. And afterwards, everyone left, and I was about to dig in, and out of nowhere, this young woman jumps in front of me, outstretches her hand, and she goes, Hi, I'm Fatima, and you're going to listen to me right now. And I forgot all about the food, because this woman was demanding my attention. And she said how, you know, India's eradicated polio. Isn't it, isn't it such a humili humiliation for her people in her country that they haven't done that yet? And she said, I'm going to do something about it. I need your help, your support. Don't want you to lead it. I just need your moral encouragement. And I stayed in touch with her. And she would end up leading this movement, despite the fact terrorists were willing at this stage to kill anyone involved. Her university almost expelled her because they thought she was a threat because of this terrorist um, um, threat against anyone involved in the effort. She went on local radio. She passionately delivered this message. And you know what happened? She ended up, um, so much was her resilience that not only did she go out and get kids vaccinated, but the school, which was originally going to expel her, actually caved in and they saw her speak and I remember going back there and the director of student services who at one stage was her biggest critic said you know what after seeing this courage she said we can't stand back and do nothing while kids are dying and because of these threats from the terrorists any support needed is guaranteed and will be forthcoming and he said of Fatima he said this is a remarkable young woman who is destined to be a future health minister of our country and this young woman had never left Islamabad before. I was actually just in next week on Thursday, we got her a scholarship to study at Columbia University. She's never left Pakistan. She'll be arriving in New York the day after I get back. And I'm convinced that this young woman is going to change the face of her country. And so my challenge to you is, what can we do to change not just the face of our country, but also of the world? And I agree that I have no doubt there are future leaders out there. So thank you for having me today, and let's create the world we want. <laughs>